A plot twist can either make or break a movie. Pull it off and the story is all the better for it, but get it wrong and audiences can swear the film off forevermore. The art of a great plot twist can't ever be underestimated, and every so often, a genuinely brilliant twist will somehow find itself landing in an otherwise dud movie, near enough redeeming it in the process. With major spoilers ahead, I'm Ewan, you're watching What Culture, and here are 10 more awesome plot twists that totally save terrible movies. Number 10. Esther is Dead, Orphan First Kill For the most part, this prequel to 2009's wonderfully unhinged horror film Orphan provides a pretty by-the-numbers origin story for psychopathic serial killer Lena Klammer, played by Isabel Furman. Also completely blindsides viewers with a wildly unexpected mid-film twist. First Kill shows Lena, a 31-year-old woman with a growth-stunting pituitary disorder, escaping from an estate Estonian psych ward and then posing as a missing American girl called Esther. This leads to her being quote unquote reunited with her mother Tricia, father Alan and brother Gunnar. And while it's fair to assume that the rest of the movie will simply play out similarly to the first with Esther turning psycho on her new family, things are a little more complicated than that. Once a detective discovers who Esther really is, she's suddenly saved by Tricia who shoots him dead. Tricia then reveals that she knew Lena was an imposter the entire time because the real Esther was killed four years earlier during an argument with Gunnar. To protect her son, Tricia covered up Esther's death while keeping her husband totally unaware. Basically, this seemingly totally normal mother is actually a femme fatale in her own right and quite the savage match for Esther. Number 9. Jill's husband is actually Duncan when a stranger calls. 1979 when a stranger calls features one of the most terrifying openings in horror movie history. Playing on the legend of the babysitter and the man upstairs in what is honestly a masterstroke of suspense from director Fred Walton. The film actually remade and expanded upon the director's 1977 short film The Sitter. Sadly, the rest of the material is found extremely wanting. As the story devolves into a maudlin array of sequences of a private detective tracking down the recent escape perpetrator of the opening crime. That said, When a Stranger Calls does come full circle enough to nearly justify the extended story, featuring an end act twist that rivals the opening in terms of creepy abruptness. Having escaped his pursuers, killer Kurt Duncan tracks down Jill, played by Carol Kane, the babysitter he originally stalked and harassed all those years ago. We're initially led to believe that Duncan is targeting Jill's kids, but the police arrive and find nothing suspicious. Meanwhile, the private investigator we've been following, John Clifford, tries desperately to reach Jill, only to discover that the phone lines have been cut. Then at night, while everyone is asleep, Jill hears Duncan's voice from within her own bedroom. The closet door is jarred slightly open, leading us to believe that Duncan is hiding in there. But psych, he's actually dressed as Jill's husband and he's been lying in bed with her this entire time. It's a real zinger of a twist with Clifford merging to make it into the room to kill Duncan before he can do any harm. Just a shame that the middle third had to be so bad. Number 8. Caroline gets trapped in Violet's body, the skeleton key. The film follows hospice nurse Caroline Ellis, played by Kay Hudson, who takes a job at an isolated plantation house in Louisiana to help Violet Devereaux, Gina Rollins, care for her ailing husband Benjamin, played by John Hurt. Plenty of low-energy spooky shenanigans ensue, with the audience being led to believe that Violet is plotting to sacrifice Ben and Caroline to grant herself eternal life. Quite, though. It turns out that Violet and Ben are actually former slaves who have been using a ritual to swap bodies with younger folks they invite into their home. The reason for Ben's condition is that Violet recently body swapped him with the family's young lawyer, Luke, played by Peter Skarsgård, who is naturally terrified at having been swapped into an elderly man's body. In the end, Violet also 
also swaps her own body with Caroline and beats her a potion-inducing stroke-like paralysis, leaving her unable to fight back or alert anyone to what's happened. EMS then show up to take Caroline, who is in Violet's body, and Luke, in Ben's body, away, while Violet and Ben, now in the bodies of Caroline and Luke, pretend that they inherited the house from them, allowing them to keep living there. It's one hell of a savage ending in a movie that is otherwise just completely forgettable. Number 7. It's all a simulation, but the curse is real. Ghosts of War. It was all a dream! Twists are pretty played out these days, and certainly sound lame on paper. Within the context of a war film, it's actually a pretty interesting idea, especially when it comes so out of left field. Ghosts of War takes place in France in World War II, where a squad of five American soldiers are tasked with guarding a chateau, which they soon come to believe is haunted by a malevolent supernatural presence. During a ghostly attack later on, protagonist Chris, played by Brenton Thwaites, wakes up in a brightly lit room with a group of doctors watching him. Oh, this isn't Assassin's Creed. As it turns out, he and the other soldiers have been hooked up to a simulation resembling World War II in an attempt to help them recover from PTSD. Chris and his squad mates are modern American soldiers who were critically wounded while fighting in Afghanistan. But there's more. The surviving member of the family the soldiers failed to protect in Afghanistan cursed them moments before detonating the suicide vest which injured them all. And the curse turns out to be very real. Turns out the curse itself has caused the simulation to be haunted by the ghosts of the fallen family members. And so Chris vows to re-enter the simulation in order to make peace with them. However, just as he plans to do that, the machine running the simulation wipes his memory, forcing him to relive the whole scenario with no knowledge of these shocking revelations. Number 6. The Plane is Another Escape Room Escape Room Tournament of Champions Escape Room Tournament of Champions is, just like its predecessor, a disappointingly tame PG-13 horror flick further weakened by atrociously dumb writing. But its wild twist ending finally sees the film settling into the more self-aware, freewheeling tone it should have had all along. While the reveal itself is actually quite predictable, it proves that this need not be a bad thing when it's actually really fun. At the film's end, Zoe, played by Taylor Russell, Ben, Logan Miller, and Amanda, played by Daredevil's Deborah Ann Wall, finally manage to escape Minos' deadly facility and notify the police about their deadly escape rooms, bringing Minos' activities into the public eye. A victory for the trio, it seems, then, except when Zoe decides to get over a fear of flying and boards a plane with Ben. It's soon enough revealed to be just another escape room, as we saw Minos testing out at the end of the first movie. Sure, it felt like the most logical of cliffhanger endings, but it was also so delightfully ridiculous that it perhaps made even non-fans mildly intrigued to see where a third film took it. Number 5. Kirsty traded her husband to Pinhead. Hellraiser. Hellseeker. The sixth Hellraiser film admittedly has few fans, with even the return of franchise heroine Kirsty Cotton, Ashley Lawrence, giving it much juice. Hellseeker does manage to slightly compensate for its risable filmmaking and scant runtime afforded to Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley, with its climactic twist. It's eventually revealed that philandering protagonist Trevor, Dean Winters, has been scheming to kill his wife Kirsty by making her open the Laman configuration puzzle box once again. When Kirsty opened it, she instead made a deal with Pinhead, agreeing to trade her husband and four additional souls to him in exchange for her own freedom. The four other souls end up being three of Trevor's extramarital partners and a friend who was helping him plot Kirsty's murder, each of whom Kirsty murders while framing Trevor as the killer. Trevor then realizes that the car crash he was involved in at the start of the movie was caused by Kirsty shooting him in the head, and he's been residing in a hellish limbo ever since. Man, talk about tearing your soul apart. Number 4. Ashley and Nick were the masterminds. Reindeer Games 
For those who haven't seen Reindeer Games, the film follows ex-convict Rudy Duncan, played by Ben Affleck, who ends up forced to help a band of thieves rob a casino upon fear of death, while posing as his former prison mate, Nick Cassidy, who was killed in jail. But, 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 it's eventually revealed that Nick didn't actually die in prison, and instead faked his own death and has been in league with Rudy's love interest Ashley, Charlize Theron, whose real name is Millie, to set Rudy up. Before they can kill him though, Rudy manages to turn the tables and off them both. It's an amusingly ridiculous twist coming at the end of an otherwise totally ho-hum flick. Number 3. Tom is actually guilty. High crimes. Of Ashley Judd and Morgan Freeman's surprisingly large number of collaborations over the years, perhaps the silliest is High Crimes. Judd stars as Claire Kubik, whose husband Tom is arrested by the FBI for apparently taking part in a military op in El Salvador, which resulted in the deaths of nine unarmed civilians. Tom claims he was there, but that he didn't take part in the killings. And from early on, audiences are basically primed to expect an aggressively conventional conspiracy thriller in which Tom is being framed by another party. It all seems incredibly cut and dried. That is, until the genuinely surprising penny drops, when Tom tells his wife that he did indeed commit the murders and even had witnesses killed in an attempt to cover it up. Sure enough, it leads to another typical finality where Tom attempts to kill Claire, resulting in her killing him, but for a few minutes, things actually got exciting and interesting. Number 2. Aces is Sparaza's son, and Mesner pulls the plug. Smoke and Aces. Smoke and Aces is the cinematic equivalent of spending 109 minutes with someone buzzing obnoxiously off illicit substances while you're sat in the corner, sober as a judge. It's got a great cast and has boundless energy, but is ultimately just a bit annoying. The film is centered around Vegas musician buddy Aces Israel, played by Jeremy Piven, who has become a mafia informant for the FBI, prompting mob boss Primo Sparaza, Joseph Ruskin, to place a $1 million bounty anyone who can kill him and bring him his heart. Lots of loud, grating mayhem ensues over the next 90 minutes. For the truth, it's revealed to FBI agent Mesner, played by Ryan Reynolds. In fact, Israel is Sparaza's illegitimate son, and the FBI wishes for an ailing Sparaza to receive his son's heart so they can continue to drill him for information. Oh, and Sparaza himself is also a former undercover FBI agent who decided to become Sparaza for real after the FBI tried to have him assassinated for getting too deep into his cover. What? The final twist then sees Mesner, infuriated at seeing his fellow agents die for a mob boss, decide to lock himself in the operating room and pull the plug on both Israel and Sparazza's life support, killing them while FBI head honcho Locke, Andy Garcia, tries to break in. This is like some Twilight Zone Outer Limits stuff right here. And number one, everyone's still alive and Hardy isn't a DEA agent. Basic. Basic revolves around around DEA agent Tom Hardy, played by John Travolta, who investigates the mystery of a barge military training exercise at an army base in Panama, which has left numerous soldiers either dead or missing. Hardy probes the survivors for their accounts of what happened. Hardy isn't a DEA agent, but the colonel of a covert black ops anti-drug unit called Section A. Moreover, he's been in league with the dead and missing men who are actually alive, including unit leader Sergeant West, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Their goal all along? To shut down cocaine trafficking in the base, eliminate the soldiers responsible, and safely exfiltrate West by faking his death. The build-up to all of that is weirdly flashy for McTiernan, but the end result is kind of wonderful. And those were 10 more awesome plot twists that totally save terrible movies. Feel like we were too harsh or too generous? Let us know in the comments below. Either way, thanks for watching, I've been Ewan, this was War Culture, and I'll hopefully catch you next time. Unless another twist gets me.